Hi boys and girls, this is Mrs. Froelich, and this is the book we're going to be reading now. Um, this is Sounder, and it's by William H. And it doesn't say who was um, the illustrator of the story, so that's interesting that it didn't say that. Illustrated right here. So here it is, Sounder by William H. Armstrong, illustrated by James Barker. And it's a Harper book. And so here we go about a dog and I'm going to tell you that this story may seem to be upsetting you because of the way they're going to talk about people but I don't want you to get upset I want you to understand the timeline of the story and so 50 years ago I learned to read at a round table in the center of a large sweet smelling steam softened kitchen my teacher was a gray-haired black man who taught the one-room Negro school several miles away from where we lived in the Green Hill District of the county. He worked for my father after school and in the summer. There were no radios or television sets. So when our lessons were finished, he told us stories. His stories came from Aesop's, the Old Testament, Homer, and history. There was a lasting, magnific magnificent intoxication about the man that has remained after half a century. There was seldom a preacher at the whitewashed clapboard Baptist church in the Green Hill district. So he came often to our white man's church and sat alone on the balcony. Sometimes the minister would call on the eloquent, humble man to lead the congregation in prayer. He would move quietly to the foot of the balcony steps pray with a simplicity of the carpenter of Nazareth, and then return to where he sat alone, for no other black people ever came to join him. He had come to our community from farther south. Already old when he came, he talked little, or not at all, about his past. But one night at the great center table, after he told the story of Argus, the faithful dog of Odysseus, Odysseus, sorry. He told the story of Sounder, a coon dog. It's a black man's story, not mine. It's the black man's story, not mine. It was not from Aesop, the Old Testament, or Homer. It was history, his history. That world of long ago that almost totally changed. The church balcony is gone. The table is gone from the kitchen, but the story remains. W.H. Armstrong, Sounder, Chapter 1. And here is the illustration. The tall man stood at the edge of the porch. The roots sagged from the two rough posts which held it, almost closing the gaps between his head and the rafters. The dim light from the cabin window cast long, equal shadows from man and post. Posts. The boy stood nearly shivering in the cold October wind. He ran his fingers back and forth over the broad crown of the head of a coon dog named Sounder. Where did you first get Sounder? The boy asked. I never got him. He came to me along the road when he wasn't more than a pup. The father turned to the cabin door. It was ajar. Three small children none as high as a level of the latch, were peering out into the dark. We just want a pet sounder, the three all said at once. It's too cold. Shut the door. Sounder and me must be about the same age, the boy said, tugging it gently at one of the coon's, coon dog's ears and then the other. He felt the importance of the years as the, three, as the child measures age, which separate him from the younger children. He was old enough to stand out in the cold and run his fingers over Sounder's head. No dim lights from other cabins punctuated the night. The white man, who owned the vast endless fields, had scattered the cabins of his Negro sharecroppers far apart, like fly specks on a whitewashed ceiling. Sometimes on Sundays the boy walked to his parents to set a while at one of the distant cabins. Sometimes they went to Meeting House. 
There was a school. There was school too, but it was far away at the edge of town, and ter its its term began after harvest and ended before planting time. Two successive October Octobers, the boys had started walking the eight miles morning and evening, but after a few weeks, when the cold wind winter sickness came, his mother set, had said, "Give it up, child. It's too long and too cold." And the boy remembered how he was always laughing at forgetting to go to school, forgetting to school so late, had agreed. Besides, he thought next year he would be bigger and could walk faster and get to school before it started and wouldn't be laughed at. And when he wasn't dead tired from walking home from school, his father would let him hunt with Sounder. Having both school and Sounder would be mighty good. But if he couldn't have school, he could always have Sounder. There ain't no dog like Sounder, the boy said. But his father did not take up the conversation. The boy wished he would. His father stood silent and motionless. He was looking past the rim of the half lit... The, past the, he was looking past the rim of half light that came from the cabin window and pushed back the darkness in a circle that lost itself around the ed ends of the cabin. The man seemed to be listening, but so no sounds came from to the boy. Sounder was very was well named. When he treed a coon or possum in its in a permission permis, persimmon tree or on the wild grapevine, his voice would roll across the flatlands. It wavered through the foothills louder than any other dog in the whole countryside. What the boy saw in Sounder would have been totally missed by an outsider. The dog was not much to look at. A mixture of Georgia red bone hound and bulldog. His ears and nose and the color were those of red bone. The great square jaw and head, his muscular neck and broad chest showed his bulldog blood. When a possum or coon was shaken from a tree, like a flash, Sounder would clamp and set his jaw vice just behind the animal's head. Then it would spread his front paws, lock his shoulder joints, and let the bulging neck muscles fly from left to right. And that was all. A limp body with not a torn spot or a tooth punctured in its skin would be laid at his master's feet. The master's callous hands would rub the great neck and he'd say, good boy, Sounder, good boy. In the winter, when there were no crops and no pay, 50 cents for a possum and $2 for a coon hide, brought flour and overall jackets with blanket linings. But there was no price that could be put on Sounder's voice. It came of the great chest cavity and broad jaws as though it had bounced off the walls of a cave. It mellowed in a half echo before it touched the air. The mists of the flatlands strained out whenever coarseness was left over from his bulldog heritage. And only flute-like red bone mellowness came to the listener. But it was louder and clearer than any pure red bone. Red bone. The trail bark seemed to be spaced with the precision of a juggler. Each bark bounced from slope to slope in the foothills like a rubber ball. But it was not an ordinary bark. It filled up the night and made music as though the branches of all the trees were being pulled across silver strings. While Sounder trailed the path, the hunted had taken in search for food. The high, exciting voice was quiet. The warmer the trail grew, the longer the silence. For, by nature, the coon dog would try to surprise its quarry and catch him on the ground, if possible. But the great voice box of Sounder would have burst if it had tried to trail too long in silence. After a last, long, sustained stillness, which allowed the great dog to close in on its quarry. The voice would burst forth so fast it overflowed itself and became a melody. A stranger hearing Sounder's treed bark suddenly filled the night 
might have thought there were six dogs at the foot of one tree. But all over the countryside, neighbors leaning against slanting porch posts or standing in open cabin doorways and listening knew that it was sounder. If the wind does not rise, I'll let you go, honey. With me tonight. The father spoke quietly as he glanced down at the boy and dog. Animals don't like to move much when it's windy. Why? the boy asked. There are too many noises, and they can't hear the killer slipping in up on them. So they stay in their dens, especially possums, because they can't smell much. Father left the porch and went to the woodpile at the edge of the rim of the light, and the boy followed and, and each gathered a chunk stick for the cabin stove. At the door, the father took down a lantern that hung on the wall beside a possum sack and shook it. There's plenty of coal oil, he said. The boy closed the door quickly. He had heard leaves rattling across the frozen ground. He hoped his father didn't hear it, but he knew the door wouldn't shut it out. His father could sense the rising wind, and besides, it would shake the loose window panes. Inside the cabin, the boy's mother was cutting wedge-shaped pieces of corn mush from an iron pot that stood on the back of the stove. She browned them in the skillet and put them on the tin top table in the middle of the room. The boy and the three younger children ate their supper in silence. The father and mother talked a, a, a little about ordinary things. They talked the boy, talked the boys had heard so many times. He no longer listened. The crop will be better next year. There'll be more day work. The hunting will be better. The hunting was better last year. This winter. The hunting was getting worse and worse. The wind came stronger and colder than last year. Sometimes Sounder and his master hunted in the wind. But night after night they came home with an empty brown sack. Coons were scarcely seen at all. People said they had lived south of the big water. There were few scraps and bones for Sounder. Inside the cabin they were hungry for solid food too. Corn mush had to take the place of stewed possum dumplings and potato. Not long after supper, Sounder's master went out of the cabin and stood listening, as he always did, to see if he could hear the cold winter wind beginning to rise in the hills. He came back into the cabin, took off his blanket-lined overall jacket, and sat behind the stove for a long time. Sounder whined at the door, as if he were asking if someone had forgotten to light the lantern and start across the fields of the dead stalks to the lowlands or past the cottonwoods and jack oats to the hills. The boy took sound, Sounder some table scraps in a tin pan. Sounder licked the bottom of the pan. It rattled against the loose boards on the porch as if someone were walking across the floor. Later, when it was time for the smaller children in the cabin to go to bed, Sounder's master got up and put his overall jacket and went out put on his overall jacket and went outside. He did not take the lantern, lantern or sounder or the boy with him. The stern order of the coon hound to go back under the porch came in through the cabin door, and sounder's whining, whining continued long after the footsteps on the frozen path had died out. Inside the cabin, the boy's mother sat by the stove, picking kernels of walnuts with a bent hairpin. The woman watched each year for the walnuts to fall, after the first hard frost. Each day she went with the children and gathered all that had fallen. The brownish-green husks, oozing their dark purple stain, were beaten off on a flat rock outside the cabin. On the same rock, the nuts were cracked after they had dried for several weeks in a tin box under the stove. When kernel picking time came, before it was dark each day, the boy or the father took a hammer with a hand, homemade handle went to that to the flat rock and cracked as many as could be kerneled in the night in a night the troubled whimper of a child came through the little door that led to the shed room where the children slept you must go to bed soon the mother said your little brother gets addled in his sleep when you ain't in bed with him the boy reached into his mother's lap where the golden half kernels laid in the folds of her apron she slapped his hand away you eat the crumbs from the bottom of the hull basket, she said. I tried to pick two pounds a night. That's 30 cents worth, 15 cents a pound at the store if they're mostly half-kerneled and dried. The man won't pay if 
They were in, all in crumbs. Sometimes the woman told the boys stories she had heard at the meeting house. The Lord do powerful things, she would say. The boy liked it when she told her stories. They took away night loneliness. Night loneliness was always bad when the younger children had gone to bed or when the father was not in the cabin. Night loneliness is part fearing. The boy's mother had once said it to him, but the boy never was never afraid when his father was near. Perhaps she too felt the loneliness that came with the wind as it passed the cabin outside and closed it of a closest of a world whose father's farthest border in land. Nope, sorry. Father's border. In the night was the place where the lamp light ended and the edge of the cabin walls. So she told the boy a story of a mighty flood which the Lord had set to wash away all the evil in the world. When the story was over, she sent the boy to bed and continued picking out kernels and adding them to the neat mound in the folds of her apron. The boy pressed his head deep into the straw pillow. The pillow was cold, but it felt smooth and it smelled fresh. He had the same feeling he got when he rubbed his face against the sheets that hung on the clothesline every Monday. His mother washed his pillowcase and sheet every week, just like she did for the people who lived in the big house down the road. He buried himself deep in his side of the straw tick. He felt where the wooden slats of the bed crossed under his body. He rolled close to his little brother and tucked the edge of the coverlet under his body to keep out the cold that was seeping through the straw ticking. His little brother's body warmed him. He heard sound of whimpering under the porch, but sound was warm because the boy's father had put two burlap sacks under the porch for the time when the hard frost came. The boy thought there must be two pounds of nuts in the pile on his mother's lap. His mother always said two pounds is a good night's work if you can start early and there ain't a sick child to rock. He wondered where his father had gone without Sounder. They always went together at night. He heard the thump, thump, thump of Sounder's paw hitting the underneath side of the porch floor as he scratched at a flea in his short tan hair. The boy dreamed of the stock land covered by the Lord's mighty flood. He wondered where the animals would go if the water rose over the foothills. Cabins built on post would just float like boats. Porch and all, he assured himself in a whisper. If they floated from the far ends of the land and they all came together, that would be a town and he would be, wouldn't be lonely anymore. I'm going to stop right there.